Good morning, thank you for joining us, Art Basel Conversations. This morning conversation is called Society, Politics, and the Art System, and we'll tell you why at great length today. Um, I'm very grateful to have all these speakers, they're very special to me. Um, Lauren Bond is an artist and also of Meta Metabolic Studios in, based in Los Angeles. Lara Reykjavik is a curator based in New York. Ahmet Oud is an artist based in Berlin. And our moderator today, Stephanie Bailey, is also a curator of Art Basel Conversations in Hong Kong. She's editor-in-chief of Ocula and works between London and Hong Kong. Please welcome all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, can everyone hear me? OK, great. Thank you, Mary, for the introduction, and Annalie for organizing um, the, uh, everything, and of course, Tart Basel. Um, it's a real honor to have these three amazing speakers here today who will be offering their insights into the giant topics that make up this talk's hefty title um, and how they connect. So to allow for more time, I'm just going to do very, very brief background introductions, and then I'll launch straight into the conversation. Um, so Lauren Bonn is an artist who actually designed uh, the bespoke tops that we're wearing today, especially for this talk, actually. Um, Lauren is an artist who graduated from Princeton and MIT, holding degrees in architecture and the history and theory of arts, and received her early training in the studios of Martha Graham and Isamu Noguchi. Um, in 2005, she founded the Met Metabolic Studio in Los Angeles, which generates, and I quote, actions uh, that are global in focus and reach with a view to developing new tools for urban living and city planning and inventing novel social practices for political and environmental justice. Um, and recent projects include 100 mules walking the Los Angeles aqueduct, which saw 100 mules being walked from LA to the source of its water in the Eastern Sierra in homage to the animals who were crucial to the first LA aqueduct's construction, um, completed in 1913. Um, Amit Ert is an artist who now mostly works with reproducible artworks or installations, as noted in one recent interview, in which Ert talked about producing unique works from time to time, given the issue of preserving them and until they find their place. Um, in 2012, Ahmet founded the Silent University, a parallel knowledge transfer, platfo transfer platform that is, quote, specifically geared towards refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants who are degree holders with a professional background who can no longer gainfully practice their trade due to their status and their exclusion uh, through the political and social system, unquote. And Laura Reykjavik uh, is a curator and writer who was most recently the president and executive director of the Queen's Museum in New York, and before that, the director of global initiatives at Creative Time, where Reykjavik has described, uh, which Reykjavik has described as, quote, particularly generative in thinking about how to communicate and think about growing communities of thinkers and shared ways of communi communicating and doing uh, together over great distances, unquote. At the Queen's Museum, uh, Laura, ex Laura expanded on this thinking from within the museum space, conceiving of the institution as a sanctuary and a refuge for the Queen's community. So um, without further ado, uh, I was thinking about how to start this discussion. Um, and you know, the, the title is huge, and these are three huge keywords that we could really spend hours on. So I decided to break it down into three parts. Um, definitions, forms, and action, uh, forms of action, and reflections on complicity. Uh, and to warm up, uh, I wanted to start by asking each of you how you understand society in relation to your practice and the concrete experiences you all have of working with different audiences and publics. Um, is society something that you actively think about specifically? And how does the so-called art system as a political space, if you think it is, um, or yourselves as political agents within it, how does that fit into this definition that you might have based on your own personal experiences? So perhaps we can begin with Ahmet, given you're here right it's next me. to me. It's me, okay. Um, Keyword society is a big, big uh, word to start with. But I can only say it's such an old concept. You know, it's a concept that was defined a long time ago. And uh, that's precisely the, pr the problem of it. You know, we, we uh, take these words with the meaning um, they're already given, mm -hmm. but given by whom. So I think the serious problem comes from there, the, uh, the straight mind. You know, the straight mind, this was a review, this was written in uh, 1979 by French uh, 
activist uh, Monique Wittig, mm -hmm. and uh, she was telling the problem and defining the problem there. All these definitions, um, discourse, and, and terms that are defined by master, white, and man. And that's the main problem. So we, when we take those terms as given terms, like when we say society in a, in a panel discussion, as it is given as an old concept, we already fail from the beginning. Yeah. So she was proposing that we, we create a new kind of terminology, our own terminology that is not authorized or officialized. So this is what I do in my practice, within the art world or beyond the art world, within the education system or beyond the education system. Um, and this is how I approach all these terms, beyond white, master and man. So would you, awesome. would you use society? Is it something that you think about actively or would you use public? Is there, what words would you use then to describe the kind of bodies and groups and peoples that you're working with? You know, it's the same problem with the other terms that like um, asylum seekers, refugees, uh, when you use terms like that, refugee, we already create another category yeah. that comes from mainstream. So I was myself in the beginning when initiating Silent University easily and comfortably using the term and soon after realizing all the fight and struggle we were giving and doing uh, was basically also, this was one of the sources mm. that we had to kind of abolish and get rid of and, and think of uh, other terms. Mm -hmm. Like governments always all the time come up with new terms to make things easier for them. You know, also we can also make uh, come up new terms that makes more strategic and easier and useful tools for us. And I suppose also when we talk about new terms, we're also talking about new 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 groups and new publics as well. And Laura, that Laura, that's a really good um, point to bring you in because, of course, when, with your work in museums, you're working with very specific terminologies as well, and you, you're working to very specific parameters. So I wonder how you could, if you could talk about how you dealt with. Um, these terms, you know, did society come into it at all or was it public? Was that mostly the kind of think thinking that you were having at the time? Um, when I was working at the Queen's Museum, I really always talked about it as a public museum within a public park, within a really, uh, a, a much broader kind of public experience uh, of being in New York. And, you know, to me that was important even if the definition of what a public museum is in the United States isn't exactly public financially, mm -hmm. meaning that it was a largely privately funded um, yeah. endeavor. Um, but, um, but I would say that as I think about museums, um, and the reason that I think that they're important sites uh, to kind of contend with the realities of our day to day, um, is that they are in fact actual microcosms of the larger society, um, whether we think that's a good thing or not. Um, so, you know, as a microcosm, you know, I believe that if you can make change in the structures internally to museums, which are um, very specific in their construction and, um, and have the same, as Ahmed is pointing out, uh, problematic structures as the larger society, which have to be renamed and undone to a certain mm -hmm. degree, um, which speaks to a project actually that I'm, I've just begun working on now since I've left the museum, which is a research initiative um, based on the, the idea that neutrality is a myth that mm -hmm. many people ascribe to in, um, in, in, within cultural contexts, within particularly cultural institutions and museums. And to directly to Ahmed's point, um, you know, with all of the discussion that we're having um, culturally about um, inclusion and multiplicity and diversity, one can't possibly begin to address that if you do not undo this myth of neutrality that people seem to hold very dear because, of course, it reinforces the status quo. Right, and it also relates to what Amit was saying about how terminologies that we use tend to have been formed or defined by power structures or people in power, let's say. And, of course, the museum, as you've always said, is not neutral at all. It's a space of power itself. Um, and this makes me think, um, actually, Lauren, of what we discussed briefly earlier about Isamu Noguchi. Um, because, of course, society as a word is so broad and so abstract, it's a form, right? In the Platonian sense, it could mean something different to everyone who, who hears the word, and it can be defined in different ways. So I wonder if you can maybe talk to us a little bit about how you uh, kind of thought about this word in terms of the talk's title, um, given your own practice, and how you also insert yourself into infrastructures. You work with different bodies, different stakeholders um, within L.A., 
Um, for me, art is the arrow which an individual can send um, right into society and right into politics if it's well aimed. So um, it's my practice is a lot about form shaping and creating a new paradigm um, that can trigger the possibility of another way of behaving socially. So Osama Noguchi, who I trained with in the last year of his life as an intern, was very interested in the limitations of the object to getting at what Plato would have called the, um, the shadow of what's real. The real is the form behind the object and the thing which catalyzes the human imagination to understand the inalienable that drives us to be makers at all. The concept of justice, for example, is a form. The um, application of that might be a salon um, or a conversation. Um, so in the work that I've been trying to do in Los Angeles, I've looked at the things behind politics, um, the form of um, social justice access to water, for example, something we can all in society agree that we need to function at all, and looked at how art practice can um, move behind the electoral politics into the body of politics, and that is that all of us who join uh, uh, each other in society assume that by paying our dues in society, we have access to simple things like water and um, the ability to um, have access to enough to eat and enough to educate our kids. Um, and, and we often call that the commons. Okay, I'm so glad that you brought that up because, of course, when you mentioned water, these are common resources, of course, and that's where this whole notion of the commons came about, which were these shared resources that are necessary to our survival, to our, benef uh, our betterment. Um, but I wanted to hit on uh, what you said about going beyond politics, because, of course, politics is another key word in, in the title of this talk. Um, and it also could mean so many things to so many different people. So I wonder if we could very briefly um, understand where you're coming from, each of you, when it comes, how you approach that word as well, politics, and how you approach it as an agent and within a space, within the space that you work. Open. Whoever wants to go first. Uh, I'm happy to jump in since um, there are a few slides up right now about um, a, an important um, aspect of the commons, uh, the inaction of a commons at the Queen's Museum. Um, after the election of Donald Trump in 2016, um, there was a real kind of very local, hyper-local crisis um, in and around the museum, in part because 5% of our staff were DACA, um, which meant that they were um, able to, young people who were brought um, to the United States by their families uh, when they were too young to sort of make that decision on their own. Um, and Obama had passed a, um, an executive order allowing them to stay and have actual legal, doc legal documentation. However, one of Donald Trump's um, campaign uh, promises was to revoke DACA. And so the day after the election, I had 5% of my not very large staff feeling very insecure about their personal future and ability to continue living in the country they'd always called home. So these were not abstractions in that particular moment. These were realities, not, not to speak of the many, many people in the neighborhoods around the museum who really use the museum as a resource um, who wouldn't leave their homes. I mean, they weren't sending their kids to school. It was quite dramatic and very real. Um, and so one of the things that we talked about was to um, actually join the art strike that was called for the inauguration day um, on January 20th. And I asked my staff, we started meeting every two weeks. We had all staff meetings every two weeks in the aftermath of the election to just kind of continually reinforce the museum's support of whatever folks needed at that moment. And there were many different strategies that we adopted, but one of them was to hold a particular event because I said, look, we can strike in the sense of literally not showing up at work, but we can also do something else. We can close the museum to regular business and host a, an event of some kind. And um, everyone wanted to do something. Most of my team were artists anyway, who were also working in the 
cultural institutional role, which is super common. Um, so we decided to do this um, poster and printmaking workshop um, for all the protests that were coming up. And over 350 people came, and people really were very grateful to have a place to go to not feel alone on that moment. So in a way, um, to get to your question, um, you know, politics is something that we see and read and hear about a lot in a very structured sense, but there is the politics of life. And I think that the place that cultural institutions and culture generally Culture is the politics of life, and that is not an, that's not something that's debatable even. It is, it, the, the, the two are uh, inextricable from one another. Yeah, absolutely, and I think this relates also again to the commons, right? Because negotiation within the commons is, is, is a political situation, really, isn't it? It's, it's more about civil society, how civil society chooses to organize itself and manage itself and maintain itself. So, Lauren, I, you're yeah. nodding, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been interesting for me in the work that I've been doing with bending the river back into the city, because if you take a very common sense around your kitchen table problem, which is how do you um, reconnect an ancient floodplain with a river that used to run there when in contemporary culture that's managed by the Army Corps of Engineers, which is a federal agent that since 1930, when the concrete jacket was built for what's now called the LA River, mm -hmm. nothing has ever been done to alter it. So you've got masses amount of wastewater running out to sea and a city that has no trees in the eastern part of the city because there's no water. And we know that culturally all civilization uh, feeds itself on floodplains. So I propose the idea, wouldn't it be fun and wouldn't it be good if we just pierced a couple of little holes in that concrete jacket and move the water into a network of public parks? And everybody said, that's a great idea. You only need to have 76 federal, state, and local permits to do it. And I was like, great, let's do it. So um, I, I've been working on that since 2005, among, <laughs> uh, uh, and I finally have 76 um, uh, permits in my hand. And once I did, I went to the, uh, my friends at the LA DWP, who find me terribly entertaining, because um, they never thought this was possible. And they said, good job, Lauren. Now that you've got all those permits, we forgot to tell you that once you lift that wastewater river up, you're going to have to pay us to distribute the water for free to a network of parks. I said, what? I they said that they're the only agent. They monopolize the water source in LA, so if I wanted to essentially become a utility, I had to apply to the California Water Board for a water right. I said, how do, they, how do I do that? They said, it's your political right as a tax-paying American to apply for a water right, we'll send you the form. They sent me a form, and for some bizarre reason, I got LA's first private water right. So now there's two water rights in the city of LA, the LA DWP and me. That's amazing. So, um, you know, it's just to say that art practice can be a Trojan horse in political systems sometimes because they find these concepts um, intriguing, charming, entertaining, but not viable. Mm -hmm. And I think the real question for art practice is how can we tenaciously engage our civic rights until we make micro shifts. Yeah. So I think a lot of activism looks at the very broad picture that um, individuals um, can actually exercise way more than they think as long as they're not hell bent on succeeding. Mm. I, so you can succeed if the concept even moves the dialogue slightly. Right. So just to clarify, and this is to explain to the audience about bending the river back into the city, which broke ground this year, actually. Yeah, it's, there it's you go. Good. That's that picture. Amazing. Um, so the picture that you have on the left is a piercing into the industrial corridor in an old tow yard called Vertelli's. That's where O.J. Simpson's car was taken after he, he was arrested. And the picture on the right is the framing of the extension of the Spring Street Bridge, which is carrying a water pipe, which will move 
my water, which I have a problem saying. Um, as I say, I've changed my, my water right to in, in the contracts that I'm making with the state parks to a responsibility to water. So the water wheel, which is on the left, is a tool which is crowdsourced. Um, it's owned by currently 130 different community members, um, and it will be organized. The water utility will be organized as a post-capitalist-driven water utility. We write the contracts for who gets the water based on um, who will share the responsibility to water. At currently, that park on the, the bottom left, the nose of that park, which is an emerging park, 32-acre park, um, has agreed to accept this free water in exchange for our demands that no more toxic pestic, pest, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides be used and retoxify the water supply. Could you just talk a little bit about the cleansing of the water? Like, how does this actually work? How yeah. do you actually operate as a facility? Well, what, what we're doing now is um, we've ex explored something called a portable experimental wetland, which takes floodplain plants that would normally grow in the LA River and uses them in boxes so that any of our, um, our, our team of, of locations that will receive river water can detox the water themselves. Mm -hmm. We've had a water engineer explore it so that we know that we can take 90% of the pathogens out of LA River's wastewater without adding chlorine or UV filtration. However, we will be zapping it with UV filtration um, um, and a couple of chlorine pellets uh, at the beginning due to my lack of desire to be sued um, <laughs> in case um, in case I have to take responsibility for for the water um, personally since it's my water right um, but it turns out to be not so difficult to to clean water and that's what flood pl floodplains have done for millennium so we've just figured out how to make that portable and distribute it to a network of schools senior centers um, and parks mm. So from a common resource like water, um, I wanted to move to a common resource like knowledge um, and education. Uh, you know, the idea of the commons is something that's important for everyone here, and, and it's, it's a very much about creating a space of community that's bound by um, shared needs. Uh, Ahmed, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this in relation to the silent university. Um, which, as you said, it, and I quote, it's a solidarity-based knowledge exchange platform by refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants, unquote. Um, and the, the part of the project was to challenge the fact that institutions, especially in the field of art, don't have the capacity to invest the required long-term commitment. Um, and I'm quoting you, actually, needed to create what you've called a truly successful pedagogic practice. So in many ways, the silent university was an attempt to almost pull institutions into more of a long-term engagement with questions surrounding how do you actually produce new forms of, of knowledge exchange, knowledge production, um, and circulation. I wonder if you could expand on that a little. A few things. I also didn't comment about the question about um, politics, and I was hoping to forget that I didn't answer that. Well, politics and um, this. And it's connected to knowledge mm. as well. Well, politics uh, alone doesn't mean anything. And it's actually, uh, yeah, to me, it's very useless when we just put it in exhibition titles and conferences and things like that. But it comes with a lot of other keywords, like uh, administration, uh, the story you told, it's basically the story of that. Uh, bureaucracy, you know, story of that. So a lot of things, any kind of political action, uh, any kind of action actually that is engaged in communities and anything social uh, that requires that kind of process. And uh, it doesn't matter if you deal with uh, the structure that is, you know, um, university or art institution or government, it's similar process. So I don't like to create an empty a zone for a genreification of political something political, but I wanna uh, focus on what is actually uh, another zone that we can create ourselves to take action that can uh, have results. So you mentioned Silent University was an attempt 
but actually it's not was, it's still on, mm -hmm. and it's not an attempt, it's still happening, but not necessarily with the art world, because art world capacity, I mean, art institutions, especially the large ones, doesn't matter, um, capacity to pursue ideas like that maximum up to two years because they have to do budgeting every two years and and uh, maximum the examples that artists with artists initiatives it's five years examples and we are having the sixth year of silent university within and beyond art institutions uh, one of the most successful example is actually initiated by a theater in a small German town and uh, another one is a, a socialist uh, education center in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So we, although we started with art institution, they were more slow mm -hmm. uh, to transform themselves. And the idea was to transform anyway, whoever, whatever, and what kind of institution involved. But uh, to get the speed right, we didn't wait for authorization. So the, the, the problem with people who have the knowledge and you know that <laughs> you can wait for years to get any authorization. Uh, of course, it's good to get the authorization at some point, but that should not slow us down. So with Silent University, all lecturers and consultants, even though they didn't have documents, even though they didn't speak the main language of that country, they, are, they were uh, forced to move. Um, uh, they didn't speak that language. They were able to actively uh, uh, lecture, give lectures, participate in conferences, as I do right now, and be paid for it, although it wasn't legally possible. Mm. So we have been doing practicing this, and this is a, um, you know, a, a very radical. It looks like a very radical version of education, you know, uh, platform, but it is supposed to be the actually the main mainstream system should be functioning that way. So where does the silent university sit within your practice? Is this kind of parallel ongoing para-institutional form that's just continuing to evolve and grow? And then you have also your other projects. I mean, there's the day after the uh, after debt, which you presented um, at the Broad in collaboration with Proto Cinema, um, which was all about um, deal work. You worked with a debt cancelling uh, collective. Um, in order to kind of make a gesture towards the um, issue of the debt culture surrounding higher education in the United States. And that, that manifested as a kind of exhibition in which um, artists were invited to create sculptures that were collection points that people, people could donate money to. Um, or let's say you have, uh, you know, you've had exhibitions, at your exhibition at the Van Abba Museum, which was a 10-year retrospective, and you had your object works there, of course, which inclu included things like Bakunin's Barricade, uh, which amazingly, you, re you restaged or um, you staged a proposal that Bakunin had made in 1849, which was never realized, which was to use paintings as a barricade um, to protect uh, a socialist insurgency in Dresden. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how, as I said, how does the silent university sit with your practice as a whole? And then also, I wonder if you could talk about how these different components somehow mirror the way that you also have to work with different bodies, different institutions, different people's terms, juggling so many different things? Well, the moment you see all as the same thing, it becomes easier. <laughs> so, <laughs> I studied art and I'm practicing artist without taking a break so far. Um, but meanwhile, I, I realized I could also act as an initiator, uh, as an agent, you know. Uh, as a citizen, I would say, but I can't really say as a citizen because I'm kind of against that concept as well because it's including ex exclusion of uh, a lot of people who don't have those documents. If you have like a constitution of citizens, we are actually talking about uh, an, an, a group of people excluding the majority. Uh, so when you, uh, you know, see everything as one thing, uh, when you see an art fair as a non-political thing, and uh, a government museum more political thing, and private museum less political thing, I mean, there is there's a big problem there. Uh, but when you see everything as one thing, there's institutional structure, also within our bodies, and uh, within our com communities, you know, we need to always come up with new ideas, and new strategies, and new tools. You know, when you want to marginalize yourself and with your all ideals and uh, stand against the system, mm -hmm. you actually also lose from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, all those movements, they fail after a few months. 
they, they have to create their own bureaucracy and administration. I mean, Akbal Ahmad is calling it um, out-administering, you know. Uh, or um, it, it could be constitutional dis disobedi disobedience. So you can uh, hijack those words that are always used against us instead of trying to figure out what they mean, instead of always calling lawyers and <laughs> getting their helps. Uh, we can all become our own lawyers mm. and invent our own, you know, um, I mean, there was a security guard at the door earlier. I was trying to enter from the wrong gate. And he said, uh, sorry, I cannot let you in. Uh, and I said, do you know what's happening inside? He said, I don't care. I just cannot let you in. Only after 11. I said, OK, well, I will miss my talk. <laughs> you know? And he said, he doesn't make the rules. He just follow the rules. Yeah. No, and that was kind of like uh, we looked at each other at that moment. It's like, w do we really want to be in that position? You know, uh, just follow the rules, but we write the rules. So the, the rules are written, as I said in the beginning of this talk, mm -hmm. by the master, white, and man. Uh, and all the social science, all the education system around the social science, uh, when we want to talk about society and all these terms, had to be radically changed mm -hmm. and transformed. And then we can finally sit down together and uh, move on. La Laura, you're nodding your head. And of course, we've been hearing from artists who insert themselves into infrastructures and systems. Uh, I, I, Amit, I hit on your point when you said you could either stand against. And I thought about how you're all kind of standing within. Um, and so, Laura, I wonder if you could give us your perspective, because you're, of course you come from a different position. You're a curator. Um, how do you relate to what Ahmed and Lauren have said? And how could you add to it? Or Well, I think uh, there are a couple of really powerful points here. And, and two things that both Ahmed and Lauren are exhibiting is the power that art has for transformation. Um, and, and in a moment when we profoundly need to see things in radically different ways from the way that the world is going, we need art and artists to be functioning in this mode to be showing us the things we cannot see. Because I think sometimes what happens in the world is that when we are functioning within this status quo, we can't, things disappear from view. They need to be highlighted, they need to be rethought. And so art helps to do that. So, um, so that's why I am really interested in working within the art sphere, because I think we can reveal things that very few other kinds of spaces can actually show to us, so that we can literally see it again, so we can feel it again, so we can be, uh, have an embodied experience of things that are, are, are obscured to us by random other forces in the world that actually are actively trying to obscure these facts from us. So, so that's one piece. I think the other piece is that, um, that I actually really love the idea of taking an institution or a physical space that's devoted to culture and kind of contending with it somewhat on its own terms, but actually creating the, the change within it that tweak it slightly so that it's actually working in a completely different direction. And so, you know, just as an example of that, um, you know, um, I co-curated this exhibition, Mel Chin, all over the place that opened in April at the Queens Museum, and other elements have been opening across New York City. It's a project that started within the museum space, but actually spirals out to many different public sites all over New York, including the Broadway Lafayette subway station, the um, and Times Square, which opens um, in uh, the middle of uh, July. Um, but as an example, you've been seeing some images float by, so maybe they'll possibly come back up while I'm talking about this. One of the big projects, for example, that Mel executed while um, thinking about his project at the Queen's Museum portion of the show was a new commission that was um, embedded um, in Flint, Michigan. Um, at the Queen's Museum, there is a model from the 1939, that was created for the 1939 World's Fair of the watershed of New York City, which is where New York City basically gets its water from. I um, affectionately call it the blob. It's not a very attractive model, but it is useful to kind of visualizing where our water comes from. So I invited Mel as we had begun using that room, not just to have a display space for the model itself, but to talk about water justice issues in the context of 
our contemporary condition. And Mel said, well, I've been you know, working in Flint for some time, and I would like to execute a project there. He called it Flint Fit. And essentially, what he decided to do was to create a triangle between Flint, Michigan, New York City, and North Carolina, which is where he his studio is. And so um, the crisis in Flint with the uh, polluted water that the city has been uh, purchasing, actually, for its residents, um, the water is highly toxic. People can't drink the water. They can't cook with it. They can't bathe with it. For the last four years, they have been getting free bottled water, you know, like the little bottles, um, to use for their daily uh, water needs. And so, as you might imagine, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of small little plastic water bottles all over the place. So um, these are being recycled, theoretically. Um, however, Mel had a more interesting idea for their recycling. So we started a grassroots project with a number of uh, local activists who were working on the water justice issues there, collecting the water bottles. And then we made a connection with a um, textile manufacturing company in um, North Carolina that transformed the bottles into pellets and then uh, thread and eventually fabric. Um, and then in New York, um, um, I made contact with, um, with a fashion designer named Tracy Reese, who took that fabric and she designed a capsule collection of garments um, that would be fabricated by women who were working in a um, nonprofit sewing studio back in Flint. So the triangle becomes complete. The, the garments were manufactured, oh, it's going to come up soon. The garments were manufactured in Flint um, by women who were participating in a, in a program that, um, that really brought them into, back into the workforce after experiencing various kinds of difficulties. So it's a very long and involved project, but the reason that I <laughs> mentioned it at this stage is that this circuit that Mel created interferes with all of the things that we've been talking about, with politics, with bureaucracy, with the way that an art museum functions, with the way that display functions, because in the pictures you'll see the model overlaid with a steel map of the river, of uh, the Flint River. Um, this is another part of Mel's show. Um, and then the models, literally models wearing the garments, um, and then some displays showing how the, the project was made. But I think here, what the important thing to say is not only is the content of this project really, I think, very moving and important, but it's also the complexity of it. The thing about art is that it is complex. Artists think in very complex ways. And in a moment in time when basically everybody in the, oh, this is it here. So you see that that's the, the, the blob. And then uh, the, that little squiggle, the dark squiggle going over the top, that's a Mel sculpture of the Flint River that sort of suspended over the, the, the watershed. And his point is really that everywhere is Flint. I mean, New York City schools have a crisis right now. There's lead in almost every New York City school coming out of every New York City school faucet. In Congress, you can't drink from, in, in DC, you can't drink from the water fountains because they are polluted. Everywhere is Flint, Michigan. So just to say, but get back to complexity. Complexity is really important because it doesn't allow, it rejects this idea that things are one way or another. They're not on or off, yes or no. It's, it rejects the binary. And art functions in this space, and we need more of that. Um, I want to stick on this idea of everywhere is Flint because, of course, it's a very commons idea and it's a nice way to bring Lauren back in. Um, and, of course, Lauren, bending the river back into the city started with Not a Cornfield uh, in 2005, uh, which you described as 90, 90 miles of irrigation piping planted... Uh, no, sorry, it's a state parks agency contracted durational performance for which you laid... 90 miles of irrigation piping, you planted corn sourced from and returned to the Native American community and cleaned the soil of an abandoned train yard, uh, which was actually a pre-colonial watershed uh, that became the industrial service channel for Los Angeles. I wonder if you could maybe yeah. expand on this a little. Well, well, let's go back to the idea of the commons um, and who's excluded <laughs> from it. Because um, before Los Angeles was a city, uh, there was two millennium of a two millennia full of people who lived in the place we call Los Angeles, for whom the space of not a cornfield was their breadbasket because it was a floodplain. And that was the Tongva and Gabrielino Indians, who are still currently not acknowledged by the federal government as even being a tribe. So 
one of the aspects of the project is to rethink what do we mean and for whom do we use the word commons? So, you know, what do we want to say? How do we want to say it and to whom? Part of my agenda has been to reincorporate the tribal people whose home we're uh, th there graciously living on and ask them permission to cultivate this space. So that, that's the picture of 90 miles of irrigation stripping put on top of what would have been Native American um, uh, place to eat. Um, and that's at the point when I uh, did that and brought in 300 truckloads of soil to put on top of uh, archaeological ruin of the train yard with no conversation that before there was a train yard, <laughs> there might be archaeological uh, remains of something prior to the train yard. So again, when we talk about commons, one of the roles that the artist can do is the very simple concept of being conscious of... Um, of what Native Americans already do, which is to owe a conscious thanks to all of our fathers and mothers who brought us to the point that we can be here today. You know, mm. so so a large part of that work is to reintegrate um, a First Nations people back into a sense of place, and to connect it to Laura's narrative with Mel Chin. When I received my water right and was horrified by it. I immediately recognized that one great big heritage site for the globe that has not been acknowledged yet is the Great Lakes. It's the world's largest fresh water source and currently is rimmed with nuclear reactors that nobody knows about. You wow. can't even find out about it because the EPA has currently taken down all information that was up during the Obama era on where you can find really scary things like that. It only would take one small accident to completely wipe out forever um, the largest freshwater source in the world. And these are all the, the reality behind politics. It's up to us to say, this information is horrifying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we need to operate on a scale that society has the capacity to destroy. So what I like to do is use art practice as a convening for citizen action groups. And I recently had an exhibition at MOCAD, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, Whereas rather than having an opening, I invited all of the small river um, nonprofits around the Great Lakes, both in Canada, in Cleveland, in Detroit, in Chicago, in Rochester, to come together for a, a symposium on how do we think outside of the current um, political definitions of who we are and where we live and maybe redefine country itself in a world post-borders because they don't seem to really be working. Mm. And to think about definitions again, I mean, um, you said that you started to explore a potential new form. This, this, idea, this idea of exploring a potential new form has been a process that you've been undergoing and engaging with um, since the beginning of what you've called your sculptural career. So I would love to know how, you know, how, how, how do you just, this is actually related to the definition of arts, so I mean, I'll come to you as well on this, um, which is how would you, how do you, how does a project like this sit within your practice as an artist, and in turn, how would you then, just, how does that change the definition of what art is and what artists can do? Well, I, I think for me at least, it comes back to this idea that Plato suggested, which it, he threw out the term kora, which in Greek means vessel. And he talked about that which precedes an idea is more powerful than the thing itself. And he called those figments forms. So what's behind the concept is a form. What's realized is an effigy of that form. And what I try and make in my practice is ephemeral sculptural devices of wonder, which allow the form behind the ephemerality to become part of a public discourse. Mm. And Amit, in turn, I, I really wanted to ask, actually, you know, is something like the Silent Museum uh, University, is it as political as something like Bakunin's Barricade? They're, they're two very different forms, they're two different works, two different projects as such. Um, I think the way they are represented is important. So 
uh, Silent University was not planned to be represented as a political action, but some people involved, they want to see it that way. Some people want to uh, see it more like an ac academic uh, platform, or some people want to see it more like a political platform, uh, where, like people involved already a few years. But I think the, the most important thing the connection between Bakunin's barricade and Silent University and the day after that, which is linking the huge economic problem again in your country, uh, where the student debt is the largest debt, has been the largest debt, above one trillion dollars. Uh, trying to address an issue like that, trying to address an issue like ex ex exclusion of education or corporate, uh, corporate uh, becoming more and more corporate, uh, the, the education mainstream education system in a large scale. Um, I thought the main thing I need to focus, also working often as an artist, with the head of an artist, uh, ownership, responsibility, you use that word, responsibility, Ownership. So if you, I mean, Silent University, I already became a guest in Silent University, for instance, and that was a plan from the beginning. I was even in a panel discussion as a guest. The coordinators were themselves undocumented. They took over from the uh, coordinator that was appointed from the institution, who was a German person, and they took over uh, and they created their own assembly co-coordinator team and they emailed me and they invited me as a guest to be in a panel discussion with a politician, with a dean of a university. And it was great to experience that because I was there, there as a guest, not as the initiator, not as the founder. I didn't insist to be referred as the founder. I even fight against that. Sometimes in internal uh, bureaucratic things it's useful to refer me, but more, mostly it is actually not good to refer me when we talk about Silent University. It's actually better that I am not speaking about. It's actually better other people involved since the beginning, they have the experience and the capacity, they talk about it. And same thing in Bak Bakunin's barricade. I said, okay, I can already agree even uh, the ownership is uh, transferred to an institution. If an institution buys this piece in the future, I can already agree when there is an uprising in that country, people can come and loan the piece uh, back to the streets. So it's not a symbolic barricade that's standing in a white cube and uh, making an internal art joke, but it is actually a challenge for future. We are not only talking about present. Uh, we are not talking only about uh, situations that are ordinary you know, the setups that are ordinary. We're also talking about crisis, unexpected situations, and quite extreme situations that museums sometimes end up uh, functioning in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at any country at war, you can and look at the museums in those countries and how they function, you can see either they close down or they transform. They have to, you know, the position transforms. But they still have collections. Mm -hmm. What do we do with those collections? Are they staying in the storages? or they are deactivated. So Bakunin's barricade was, the, was this failed idea of Bakunin, uh, which wasn't taken serious by, by his friends in Dresden when he proposed. And then I proposed it again, and it's still a proposal. It's not real yet until it is sold, but it will be. And then the decision making is not up to me anymore. It's up to the museum, up to the institution in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. What do they do with it? So the responsibility, how we negotiate responsibility, especially in the future with institutions and with ourselves, uh, is important. And authorship. We need to be able to give up and fire ourselves when it's necessary. Right. And of course, Bakunin's barricade raises questions of the objects and, and what is the object necessary in a practice. And, it, and I think also when you're talking about how it's better to not uh, refer to yourself as founder, it sort of raises the point that artists is a great cloak of invisibility sometimes when you want to go into these situations and do things that might not necessarily have been done if you were to go through different channels, let's say. So um, actually, I wanted to, we talked a little bit about the, the terminologies of art and artists, but um, Laura, I'd love to know how you would relate to that in relation to the curator and the role of the curator, which is obviously changing. Um, and of course, you have been absolutely at the center of these changes. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, of course, we have to talk about the, the how you've been central to discussions surrounding abuses of power. We are in a space of power right now. Um, so I guess we're now moving into the complicity part of the conversation, but we're going to segue a little bit by just, um, I'd love to know how you would uh, place your practice as a curator. How would you describe it? You've talked about being more interested in creating conversations 
um, and not to be didactic. So I wondered, where does the object sit for you? Um, how do you see your work with artists? And how do you actually see your changing role as a curator today? Lots of things to say about that. <laughs> um, I guess I would start by saying that, um, you know, the, the role of a curator uh, has always been shifting to a certain degree. Um, you know, uh, cu fr coming from the word curare, to care for, uh, as in caring for collections, um, making exhibitions is quite a different thing from caring for a, 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 a stationary collection. Um, and, um, and now that everything's curated, I'm not exactly sure what the word means anymore. <laughs> There's actually a, um, a shop on 6th Avenue in Manhattan that recently closed that's called Eyebrow Curators. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what they do there to your eyebrows, but they apparently curate them. Um, so, you know, um, so we, we have a lot of uh, curation going on in the world. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, look, the museum, the museum as a space, the cultural institution as a space requires um, um, many things, right? It, you, it's a site for the display of art. It's a site for the convening of people. Um, you know, I feel like the, the, at the core of it, uh, from my perspective, I would like to invite artists and projects into that space to connect with something that uh, reflects the realm of the real, that is connecting for folks who maybe don't have the same kind of, um, you know, either uh, educational background or specific interest even in um, in art qua art um, you know they may be more interested in understanding how uh, the world connects with their own um, perception of what's going on in an artwork so for me that is a very compelling piece of it um, and I I, I Really, one of the things that I was very interested in the Queens at, when I was at the Queens Museum was, um, and we received a major grant from the Mellon Foundation about a month before I left. So I'm pretty, uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to continuing this work someplace else. But, um, but. I have a real interest in understanding why, what people desire from their interactions with art, and designing ways for that interaction to happen on another register. So for example, I really obviously, I, I think curatorial practice is incredibly important, but that practice is always gonna be grounded in the language of art history and of art. And for some people, that's just not what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So for other people who don't have that particular interest, how do you create a different register for interaction? Um, I don't know what that looks like necessarily, but I'm interested in experimenting with what that means. But it's also um, important uh, in terms of who, with whom you're working, and and the question of what happens when you reach a hard a hard block, let's say. And I, I was thinking about how you know here we're not Basel, we're a space of circulation, we're all independent agents. Not all, but some of most of us are independent agents. Well, on this panel we are. Um, so it it does raise that question of freedom and circulation, and and how free are we actually? And you talked about um, you know the art world is a microcosm of the larger issues at hand. So. How would you, uh, how, how have you faced the challenges when it comes to hardening systems of power? Well, I guess my main uh, position is that we must be enacting our values through whatever forms we work. Um, and if that means as a, as a museum director, you know, um, to me it's very important to operationalize the, the, the values that we hold dear. So for example, <clears throat> in the aftermath of the election, um, we actually at the museum collectively as a staff co-affirmed our statement of values. Um, which was uh, put, which was approved by the board and then put up on the website. And I thought this was a very important time to do this because the Queens Museum had for, you know, d decades co-created with community members who were recent immigrants, some of whom were documented, some of whom were not. And that was a really strong and important part of the identity of the institution. But I felt that under the current political situation, we might co be called to task on such things. So I thought, okay, let's reaffirm our statement of values. And, you know, that was a very concrete way of doing it that was very visible to the world. But in point of fact, for the year and a half before we did that, I had been working on very boring ways, bureaucratic, boring ways of really making sure that the museum was not just positioning itself as a place where these values were important, but also that we were actually 
enacting them within the context of the museum. Um, everything from you know uh, pay rates and um, you know the ways that we listed our uh, job openings, uh, who we tried, to, uh, the, who we recruited, how we did that. These kinds of sort of nitty gritty kind of administrative policy pieces are super important to you know if you're espousing equity, you can't. You know, you're not really doing it justice by any stretch of the imagination if you're not actually embodying it. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was a crucial element of how, as an institution, you enact your power. You can choose to enact it one way, or you can choose to enact it another way. Or, I mean, there are many ways in between, of course. But for me, it was very important to be reflecting the value. And it, it takes time. It's not like it happens overnight. Mm -hmm. But you have to be very intentional about it. So um, to feed on that point of being uh, the nitty gritty, you know, the nitty gritty questions of who are we working with, how are we working, who, who's paying us, etc. I mean, that is a nice way to bring in the question of complicity, which if we're going to be talking about politics in the art world space here on the Art Fair and Art Basel, um, it has to be asked. I mean, how would you respond to the critique that the art world um, can't affect political change, um, given its complicity in systems of power that often counter the actual politics expressed in, in artworks and artistic gestures? And this is an open question to, to the three of you. OK. <laughs> so perhaps it's time to talk about how capital can be redefined for a new era. I mean, what you see at an art fair is an exchange of capital for, um, for art. And um, a lot of money is being exchanged. And I wonder if it isn't possible to think that another art world uh, uh, could go to scale in which some of that capital could be put to use to actually have agency on, uh, on a socio-political environmental level. And maybe just as we as artists can act individually within our own communities to leverage the agency we have as makers, perhaps the art world could be a Trojan horse in international society to demand um, justice. I think it's possible. And I think that's why these panels are happening here is that it's an idea that's taking shape under our nose, yeah. uh, under the um, guise of the um, sophistication and refinement that goes along with being a connoisseur of fine art, c comes with a knowledge of what it takes to get into this position, and that we could perhaps re-level the playing field and come up with a new model for the art world itself. Another art world is possible. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say, is it working? Can you, yeah, yeah. Working, right? Yes. I wouldn't say art world will do this and we will be safe one day. No. <laughs> I wouldn't also see art world as one thing. But there is a thing in the art world, you know, these two words, there's art. And art comes in different ways and forms. and. Um, done by different agents, uh, cultural producers, not only artists. In often also in a collective manner, uh, in a small scale. There is a lot of power we underestimate what we can do with art. Sometimes, just because it is not taken serious enough by the politicians, by the other institutions, uh, and that gives also a lot of power to it. Uh, first, we underestimate it, so this change never comes because we underestimate it. But then we pay attention the, when the moment we stop underestimating and we see all these little chains and achievements. You know, they are fragmented. They are not one major change will happen overnight, and the next day we will all feel better, uh, living in a better world. But all these fragments and achievements, they come, appear, and disappear. Uh, how do we collect them? How do we archive them? How do we connect them? You know, uh, beyond our, 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 our personal achievements, I'm talking about achievements that are good for everybody that are involved, you know, from cleaner, the technician, to uh, director, everybody. I, I saw a lot of directors, they didn't feel the agency. Sometimes I feel, I, I see a head of security feels more agency than the director of the same institution. So how do we distribute this agency also to temporary contractors, temporary workers or precarious workers like the artists? 
they always seem like they are in the institution, but they are partly invited, not fully. Uh, it's same for the audience; they are partly invited. Are you? How often are you invited to the office space? You know, backstage. Uh, can you say you have seen Art Basel if you ever, if you never been in the office of the Art Basel? Can you say if you have seen the Kunstmuseum Basel if you never been in the office space of the Kunstmuseum Basel? I think these are. These are, should be non-hierarchical spaces that are completely transparent equally, then we can actually transform from that moment on those institutions and ourselves as well. Laura? Laura. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, I mean, Ahmed, I really agree with you on many levels. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think there is this kind of... Um, veil around our institutions, um, and I'll speak from that perspective for a minute, um, where uh, things seem unmovable, but the reality is that institutions are made up of people. And um, from my perspective, there is too often a, an institutional response that is monolithic rather than reflecting um, the many that go into the creation of that institution. Um, so, you know, on a certain level, I'll just pick for example, um, last year, the um, the the very um, strong feelings that uh, came forward after the Whitney Biennial um, had a painting um, by Dana Schutz in it of um, um, the, um, the murdered body of um, um, Emmett Till. Sorry, just had a blank. Um, and, you know, these were very strong feelings that people had, and clearly there are many brilliant, amazing people on the staff of the Whitney, and I would have loved to have heard what the debates were inside that institution, but because of the kind of structures that exist, it wasn't about that. It was about presenting a united PR front and, you know, kind of getting through the crisis as opposed to saying, okay, guys, you know, having this painting in this exhibition uh, has provoked, which many institutions um, desire is to pro... pro they say they desire to pro pro provoke discourse and dialogue. Well, that was certainly provoking a hell of a lot of discourse and dialogue. Uh, but the institution wasn't necessarily ready to engage with it on that basis. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's an issue that I have with yeah. the way that institutions are being run. It's, it's, it, it, it consolidates power into this monolith, which it isn't. It isn't. It should be distributed amongst the members of those institutions. And, and oftentimes is internally. It's just not visible to us as outsiders. Mm -hmm. And so that tension between, you know, kind of the institution feeling for, for reasons that are very, uh, that, that feel to them, I think, very existential. You know, how do we... Um, you know, how do we pr how do we promote our vision of the world if we're not monolithic? Well, mm. actually, you can be quite nuanced and mm. delve into the complexity that I think is appropriate for a, a cultural institution to dive into and promote the discourse and dialogue that one that that they say they want to promote um, by actually doing that. I mean, Amit, you've also talked about this as well, that part of the work that you've done is to go into, into institutions to try to encourage them to become more flexible, to be more bendable, and to be more open to um, actually taking in artist projects, not only as kind of gestures of presentation, but actual gestures that could become assimilated into the system itself. Well, a lot of directors desire that kind of change, but they cannot do it alone. So they can always use the artist and art projects as an excuse. Yeah and present it as, you know, this is artist concept, it's not really transforming the institution, but then a little bit of transformation happens. Which, well, <laughs> you know, sorry, I just want to say something about that. Sorry, Lauren. <laughs> um, you know, that happens a lot, and it's true, directors use the, use the artist, or institutions use the artist as the tool, because they say, oh, well, we're neutral as an institution, but the artist can say and do whatever they want. I mean, it's, ex it's freedom of expression. But the reality is that there's a positionality there, and you can't deny positionality of an institution just by claiming neutrality. Neutr institutions have never been neutral. Most, most cultural institutions, especially in the United States, are founded by very wealthy people who grew giant collections and decided to make them public for a whole variety of reasons from very, you know, kind of selfless reasons to wanting to get a tax break because they didn't want to maintain these giant collections anymore. I mean, these are really important things 
to recognize, and that position of neutrality is simply reinforcing whatever the dominant culture is or whatever that status quo was that developed that collection to begin with. And so we can't, you know, this is where things get really tricky. And I think in this moment of your question about complicity, I think without recognizing and actually seeing that and feeling what that means, we can't, that's why this concept of neutrality has to be completely undone. Right. And Lauren, how would you relate, given, like, how, did, how would you compare working with the State Parks Agency, for instance, rather than, let's say, um, a museum as such? How, how would you relate to what Amit and Laura have been talking about with regards to the challenges and, and the realities? Well, um, I, would, I would say that it's a constant negotiation, and it takes a tremendous amount of hubris to not take personally the answer no. <laughs> Um, um, and, and to realize that it's often a function of time before no becomes maybe. Um, if you can tolerate, um, you know, if you can tolerate no, you can be surprised that um, sometimes an original idea sits in the back of a, a, a bureaucratic mind and foments in an interesting way. Um, one of the projects that I've been working on for a decade has to do with land held in trust for US veterans as a home, um, and it's not used that way. And in Los Angeles, we've got 20,000 homeless vets on the street. And one of the images that I put up had to do with me having a meeting with Secretary Shinseki at the, in the federal government um, following uh, one of my um, Trojan horse uh, sculptures called Strawberry Flag. And he asked me as soon as I got through the door, so tell me really, tell me really what it's like on the campus of the VA of West LA. So he really had no access to knowledge because he's sitting in an office in Washington getting a million mandates on how to run hospitals, not homes. And so I said, the best thing you could do is show up a day before an official visit on a Sunday and let me show you around in plain clothes because you're never going to see what's really going on unless somebody shows you. And he did that. And he never told anybody. And within six months, things changed there. Wow. And he knew that if that information that I had taken him through there ever went public, he'd be fired. Because it's just not the way things are done. So I think that the uh, institution, um, no matter what it is, has a bureaucracy behind it. And as one homeless vet said to me in general, never underestimate the pathology of the bureaucratic mind. <laughs> I think that's a perfect uh, point to open uh, the conversation up to the audience um, for questions and answers. If we have any questions, please raise your hand. One over here at the front. Uh, <coughs> hello. Directly uh, hooking back into the concept of bureaucracy and also focusing on the place where we are currently, Art Basel, of course, we address the art part, but Basel itself, of course, is also a very conservative place where not only till next, in one week from now, the 50 year anniversary of women's rights will be, uh, women's voting rights will be uh, celebrating in the whole of Switzerland, not even 30 years. So let's consider the conservative place where we are, but also what, how can the art world align itself with this conservatism for the moment when the real extreme right is uh, uh, passing us with an incredible speed. So what are the opportunities right now of the art world to maybe temporarily align itself with true conservatism and bureaucratic structures which has a tendency to at least slow down the wars that might be coming, and then if we have stood our grounds, how can we then take it from there? But I see a potential, for, at least for the moment, to align ourselves with conservative forces, unfortunately. Interesting question. Um, I love this idea because it, it speaks exactly to what Lauren's been talking about uh, around the Trojan horse. And um, <clears throat> I've worked with a number of artists who have, um, uh, including Not an Alternative, that has the a Natural History Museum that uses the guise of actually being an accredited natural history museum in order to use the so-called neutrality of the museum to advance 
a different agenda. And I think, you know, the, the more it looks and feels like it is legitimate in this way, the more it is accepted, and then you, you can uh, actually enact change from within. And this is something that I was really committed to in the context of the museum. There are plenty of things that I find enormously problematic about the way that ways that museums function. But I also thought, if I could be within the museum, if I could act in a particular way that actually shifted the practice of the museum, and then perhaps a couple of other people might pay attention to it. <laughs> there might be another add-on effect. And like Ahmet and, and Lauren have been talking about this entire time, these are incremental and, and small shifts that then eventually add up to a bigger thing. And I think there are many of us who are allied in these ideas across the world. It's not just the three of us sitting here on stage having wishful thinking. I had my first residency in Basel. I arrived in July. I stayed until September, and it was a different Basel. I, uh, back then, I didn't see art fair. Uh, I didn't know how the atmosphere is when the art fair happens. You know, when the art fair happens, also the way I arrived here, I arrived to Central Station, took the tram, didn't get off any of the station in between, and got off at the square. You know, but the tram continues. The city still goes on. There is a little circus I went when I was here from Bo out of Boredom. It's just at this square, probably most people didn't notice. Um, so the city is there, and um, you know when the right-wing government slowly takes over, which we witness in Holland, they cut at some point 50 percentage of culture investment in culture and budget in culture. Um, it was a wake-up moment in Holland, in a place where, where you see this, you know, social structure for art and culture is there permanently. No, it was, it came in '68 uh, with the legacy of '68 and. It uh, developed, and they always valued uh, foreigners, artists, and cultural people being in the country. That's a contribution. It's a cultural surplus. So they always valued, and there was a moment, government changed, and they, they cut it into half. It can also happen in Switzerland. You can think Art Basel is a little island, the square, and we are in this giant building, but this building might be lost overnight and government might decide they don't want foreigners traveling here, although it's good for the economy and so on. Uh, they don't want foreigners, more foreigners coming here, and this happens in many countries. And all of a sudden, this untouchable, very powerful art structures like this one can disappear. And uh, we always see it as granted and given, and it's going to stay the way it is. That's why I would like to sp speculate always in my practice as well, the future crisis not to create a dystopian future, but also really take care of this culture surplus that we, including the dead, the living, and the unborn, you know, including the all. And we have to pay attention to that. And if you go only after our own profits and uh, our own uh, short careers and stuff like that, we, we can easily miss the big picture, and this kind of political change can happen overnight. And yes, thanks for bringing that up. Lauren? Thanks. Very good question. I would say that complicity and its twin evil brother of marginality are a constant problem. Um, you know, you, you, you pay taxes in the United States and you're paying into a war economy that then as a uh, liberal person or even farther to the left than liberal, you're horrified by that. We also in the U.S. still don't have an equal rights amendment at all. So, you know, it's an incredibly fraught world to navigate. But at the same time, um, we have to participate um, to, to engage in the world in some, in some way. We're really, uh, at the moment, at risk of losing the lungs of the planet because of the Amazon being the next sourced place for energy and materials and mining. And I've been engaging with um, people in the Amazon only to discover that the companies that are pulling down um, the rainforests are sending oil to Los Angeles for my car. So I didn't realize it was specifically <laughs> um, aimed at, at my consumption patterns. So I think complicity is part of our lives and is a very, very uh, difficult and daily thing to, to negotiate. But I want to, um, Eunice, I mean, in terms of conservatism, I mean, would, I, I'll put this to the panel. I mean, would you not say that the art world, and when I say art world, I'm talking about the mainstream institutional 
art world space, is that not already a very, not very, it's a conservative space already, um, when you actually think about the challenges that practitioners face within it, um, the power dynamics that are occurring, um, the marginalities and the alienations that occur within the labor structure, the labor force as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I wonder if you could just make, this is, relates again to definitions, because how conservative are you talking um, in terms of how to align? And, and then in turn, how would you then, what does that say about the art world itself? Well, I would like to speak to that based on my experiences at the Queen's Museum, because that was clearly um, a case in point, um, in the sense that, um, you know, uh, as the director, you're, uh, you are, uh, you serve at the pleasure of your board of trustees. And if you don't have uh, an alignment with them philosophically, politically, et cetera, you run into trouble. Um, so, you know, in my particular case, um, you know, once, uh, once the president was elected, the current president of the United States was elected, there was a huge amount of fear that settled in to the board which I, which I did not account for because I didn't see them as a vulnerable population, but that fear existed. And so when I proposed things like the art strike or um, this idea that art spaces might become sanctuaries, not just for immigrants, but for any vulnerable populations, and this notion that I had been developing with a group of people who were working in New York around what it might be to develop an art space sanctuary growing out of uh, the sanctuary movements in Central America from the 80s to the new sanctuary movements in the 90s, um, that this might be a power powerful way to say we are institutions, yes, but we also care. Um, we are spaces of care and we are spaces for the public. Um, and the resistance that I got to that was very conservative in that sense um, because there was a real need, there was a real need related to the populations that we served for a very long time, which I couldn't, I couldn't quite grasp why there was this resistance to it, but it was very personal. They felt at risk. And so there was a disjunction then, you know, there was a disjunction between the things that I felt were important as a director, that I felt were important for the museum, um, doing what it did, doing what it had done for very many years before I got there, um, and the things that they thought were important. And so, you know, that conservatism bore out. Now, I think what Eunice is talking about is something far more extreme. And at a certain point when we were discussing this sanctuary idea, somebody said to me, well, you just can't have people sleeping in the museum. And I said to myself, I didn't say this out loud, but I said to myself, well, actually, if we were in that moment of saying, holy shit, there is some crazy stuff going down outside. Yes, people would be sleeping in the museum, and people have. I mean, not in the Queen's Museum necessarily, but there is the potential for that moment to come, and not just in the United States and not just in Europe, but all over the globe right now, there are very precarious, very specific circumstances that might come to that. And, you know, um, I do think that we need to be prepared for these, as, as um, Ahmet was saying, these, like, uh, potential horrible futures. And just to tag on to what Laura was, Laura was saying is that um, the state park, for example, is organized so that nobody can grow food or medicine on it. It specifically states that nothing can be grown because of the emotional attachment. People get to growing things, and they don't want people, they want a public space to not be assigned to that kind of connection. So um, in the contract that we are have just signed with the state park, I wanted an emergency clause. I said, well, in a worst case scenario, if uh, our water is being used to amend soil on a 32 acre property, we want to be able to grow food and medicine here. And they said, absolutely not. So that was the one, that was the one um, stipulation we could not um, get through. And it just goes to show you within the bureaucracy how really the articulation of public space is for a faceless public. <laughs> it does not have um, any connection to the notion of a, an impassioned individual or any particular narrative, and it is perceived by people like the Tongva and Gabrielino as a continued marginalization of their ritualized practices. But of course, 
it could equally be said for anybody who doesn't have access to health care, which is most people who are not employed in the United States, can't do simple things like grow uh, medicine to share in a public park. Right, which brings us back to Ahmet and the, th the point that you made about the terms, the definitions of the terms that we use aren't actually our own and they were imposed somehow. Yeah, I would just uh, make a little positive picture at the end of this. <laughs> You know, there's, a, there's no hierarchy between recognition and authorization. Uh, if you value authorization more, we are in trouble, and we have this bad future scenario. But rec recognition is immediate, and we can immediately have it done. And I also must say it's uh, 13 years I'm actively working within this field and in and out of this field. I have witnessed several miracles. I mean, I've, I've witnessed them, a lot of things, if you told me 10 years ago, I wouldn't believe happened. I've seen them, I've seen those things happening, only few people getting together, and in institutions, in neighborhoods, in cities, in places. So that's why I keep doing what I'm doing, because there's like this huge potential, and we also see the results. You know, we don't have to wait 100 years to see it's happening. Um. I think we have time for one very quick question, if there's anyone in the audience. Um, so maybe a nice way to end would be, uh, I'd love to ask the speakers if there's one piece of advice that you could give to the future generations or those who are trying to find a way to work within this system. Uh, based on your own experiences, what advice would you give to those who remain hopeful? Uh, don't study art. I gave this advice before also. <laughs> don't study art, but keep doing art and uh, you will get there wherever you want to get. <laughs> I think for me it's about, um, it's about um, operationalizing your values in whatever mode you choose to operate. Um, and, um, and maybe something that I got out of the conference that I was recently at uh, around art and propaganda is invest in emancipatory propagandas, mm -hmm. the opposite of obscuring propaganda. So uh, propagandas that enable us to see what is invisible. Yeah. We're storytellers, and we are weaving a story that's ancient. So try and think of yourself as a conduit for these stories and not the author. Allow, allow cultural heritage and story to move through and past you and challenge the art market so that you don't see your success as, uh, as part of being the myth of an original, but rather part of a large stream um, that's moving, moving forward. It's a beautiful way to end, thank my goodness. Uh, well, thank you so much to the speakers. Thank you, Ahmed, Laura, Lauren. Um, thank you, Mary and Annalise, Art Basel, and to the audience. Thank you for staying with us. Have a great day.